So good afternoon once again uh, to everybody, a warm welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Simon Vrecher. I'm an external consultant at European Commission's Joint Research Center. And together with uh, other colleagues, uh, Alexander Kotsev, Sven Schade, uh, Marco Mingini, and uh, Marina Micheli will be hosting this uh, ELISA Action Webinar today with the title Emerging Approaches for Data-Driven Innovation in Europe. So uh, before we uh, dive in into the webinar content, let me allow a minute or two to explain a bit about the ELISA action. So ELISA stands for uh, European Location Interoperability Solution for e-government. And it's been one of uh, more than 15 action, 50 actions in the, within the European Interoperability Program, ISA Square, uh, that was actually tackling the only action tackling the location interoperability. Uh, this action was support, uh, to support the digital government transformation by making the best uh, use of location data and technology in an interoperable manner. And it is also intended for uh, public administration, cit citizens and businesses. As you can see on the next slide, so the four main objectives areas of the ELISE are uh, policy support, uh, supporting different policies initi initiatives at uh, the European um, and national levels to provide reusable, interoperable, cross-border and cross-sector frameworks and solutions for public administrations, business and citizens, uh, to discover and investigate how emerging trends and technologies enable more effective use of location data for policy and digital public services. And last but not least, to build a, a knowledge, geo knowledge base to inform and to train uh, different stakeholders and promote the adoption of the good practices and innovations in location data. Uh, as such, uh, ELISA actually provided many outputs that were packed in four different uh, streams, studies, applications, framework solutions, and the geo knowledge based service. Uh, I won't uh, mention all of them, there you can see them listed, uh, several of them on the right uh, part of the slides. So one of those is, of course, the sharing knowledge and raising spatial skills for digital government transformation, which part is also the today's webinar, so to share the knowledge and, uh, let's say, uh, the, the work that has been uh, uh, provided through, through ELISA as such. So maybe just to uh, go directly to the content and the structure of today's webinar. So what we will cover today, today's webinar is actually divided into five different sections. At the beginning, there will be scene setting from a scientific and policy perspective. And then with the three different sessions, we will dive into the, uh, to the content of the webinar and the report, of course, that will, that will be presented a bit later. So there will be innovative approaches to data sharing, IoT in decentralized architectures, and the social and organizational dimensions of the data. Last but not least, at the, at, the, at the end, hopefully there will be still time, we will try to wrap up the session and provide you with a, a few next steps. So at this moment, I would just turn to the session number one, which is a setting, a scene settings from the scientific and policies per perspective. And I would invite Alexander Kotsev from European Commission and Carlos Granel from University Jean from Spain to share with us uh, a bit uh, of the details. Please, Sven and Carlos. Thank you very much, uh, Simon, dear colleagues. Thank you for being uh, here with us today. Uh, we have an uh, interesting agenda and uh, lots of points uh, to cover today. So I would like to very quickly start by saying a few words about the policy context within which uh, we have implemented uh, these activities. Also uh, using the opportunity to mention that uh, the webinar together um, is presenting the findings that are also made available within a dedicated uh, uh, technical report of the Joint uh, Research Center, where all the lessons learned, the uh, findings, uh, technical and non-technical approaches uh, are described. So uh, if uh, you're interested in a particular topic, please uh, um, revisit uh, this report, which uh, also uh, is combined with uh, dedicated repositories uh, that uh, contain the data and source code. So this would allow the more technical findings to be uh, reproduced and reused. 
Uh, with that uh, having been said, uh, a few words about uh, the policy context. Uh, clearly, digital transformation is a pervasive topic, which is horizontal to all the other priorities uh, that we have as societies. And this applies to the different levels of governance, uh, range starting from the city, regional, uh, national, but also uh, at the European. And thinking of digital transformation, of course, uh, data uh, has a central and uh, very important uh, role to play there. As an example, uh, looking into the French presidency priorities, uh, we know that uh, now uh, France uh, is leading the European uh, Council. Uh, there are three uh, uh, topics, uh, Europe's sovereignty, climate, social and uh, digital transition, and uh, Europe uh, uh, for uh, 2030 and a vision uh, for Europe. So uh, within those contexts, uh, data for all of those priorities plays a critical role. And we have uh, a very ambitious uh, and, and interesting uh, um, uh, strategy under uh, development, uh, the European strategy for data, which envisages the creation of a pan-European single market for data. Uh, in doing so, uh, it uh, addresses different uh, problems having to do with the availability, sharing, interoperability, uh, quality, infrastructures, capacities, and so on and so forth. The idea of this strategy uh, uh, is, and the single market for data is to be uh, achieved through uh, the establishment of sector-specific uh, data spaces. We have several uh, prominent legal initiatives uh, in the pipeline on the European level. The Data Governance Act uh, that uh, has to do with the fairness in the data economy, the Digital uh, Market Act uh, about uh, the role uh, of big tech and uh, platforms, the Implementing Act uh, under the Open Data Directive for the so-called high-value data sets, uh, as well as um, the Data Governance uh, Act. So all of those together will help us implement the European strategy uh, for data. It is important to emphasize here that within the European strategy for data, there is no concrete technological approach uh, that is uh, defined. Uh, uh, and uh, within the work that we are presenting uh, today, we want to, to uh, inform uh, in a very um, pragmatic uh, uh, way the implementation of the strategy. With that, uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, Carlos to say a few words about the scientific perspective. Over to you, Carlos. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, my name is Carlos René from the Universidad Jaume I, Castellón. And I want to, to, to explain briefly, actually, the scientific perspective and methodological approach of, of this report. As Alex commented and connected this to the, to the policy dimension, the main title of, of the report is about emerging approaches for data-driven innovation in Europe. But uh, actually, the subtitle of the report, which is Sandbox Experiments on the Governance of Data and Technology, actually reflects the scientific perspective, right? So we can see here the key terms uh, of this subtitle, which is actually the governance of data technology, which um, create the context, the overall context and the overall challenge of this report, of this, of this work. And, and basically, uh, the, the implementation part is driven by this sandbox experiment, right? As, as we uh, come up with a series of experiments following a pool of expert approach. But for now, we're going to explain briefly each of these three dimensions. Next, please. All right. So um, related to the um, overall challenge or, or context, actually, so the main challenge of, of this report is to explore and improve innovative uses of technologies. As Alex commented, actually, we are not there is not a specific approach. So we are trying to experiment and explore different technologies and tools um, uh, for data-driven innovation in order to, and the result of this project, basically of this experimentation project is to inform new policy design and implementation and hopefully actually just to come up with new data governance models. So next, please. All right. So, 
we can see actually the relationship between the upper part of the circle and the bottom part of the circle that we have actually two complementary views here. One is related to the technology and tools, uses of technology of tools in order to, um, for improving the governance of data. And the other part is basically just to understand these socio-technical aspects um, related to the governance with data. So basically these two vision, these two complementary vision actually shape the different experiments at work that uh, we did throughout this, this report. Next, please. Um, obviously this is connected to the, to the European policies and we are just starting with the new uh, European research framework. And basically there are a lot of, of economical aids and, and funding in order to explore all these dimensions that we mentioned here today. Next, please. Okay, so let's focus now on the pool of expert approach that we follow in order to do the job here that we are reporting here today. Um, basically, in order to cover the overall challenge that we discussed briefly uh, before. So basically we recruit, let's say, a set of experts with different backgrounds and, and expertise, but complementary, right? Because they are coming from the academia and, and industry. Uh, they are uh, scientists, professors, and also senior developers and, and engineers, and basically working on the social sciences and science in general. So the idea is just to have a a different group of people that can cover a lot of state-of-the-art technology tools in their field. And the idea was to, these people are the best positioned in order to define different use cases that can be useful to um, provide insights, to help, to make a reality actually the European data strategy, right? So for each of the experts actually define different use cases and define uh, and design different uh, experiments that we will talk in a minute, right? That we will follow these unboxing experiments. As a result of this process, as a result of each experiment, actually we come up with a set of recommendations and lessons learned that can be useful for future research and um, policy making in the future. Next, please. Okay, so talking about the specific experiments that we mentioned, so um, in this project, in this report, actually, we follow this sandbox experiment, sandbox approach. So sandboxing means basically uh, the definition of contained experiments to safely explore a particular research question, right? So uh, basically this means that um, for this kind of experiments to support this data data driven innovation data is central for sure because basically is the main ingredient in order to run to design and to get resources on these experiments uh, we try to use real world data instead of synthetic data and um, Obviously, all the data that we use in the experiments is also available in the GitHub repositories that we will mention later on in the presentation, right? We also use code, model, libraries, and tools in order to make sense of this data and analyze this data. And basically, from the organizational perspective, we did these experiments um, given the short time of the short period of time that we had to do this, basically a matter of month. We follow these agile approaches in order to continually have some kind of sprints in order to um, make progress during the experiments. Obviously, some of the experiments needed some kind of co-creation, co-design in order to talk on and collaborate with different stakeholders. And each of these experiments actually define one chapter of the report, right? So the idea in the end to run this kind of contained experiments or sandbox experiments is to learn and reflect about the specific results and I'm finding before actually rolling out these recommendations and lesson plans widely for policy making. All right, next please. Thanks. So this sandbox experiment actually defined the whole process, the whole report and Logically, we have divide, divide the, the report in two parts. One is about the, the governance of data with an innovative use of technologies and tools. And the other part is more related to governance with data, experiments that uh, try to cover or exp 
explore the differences of technical understanding and relation with data-driven innovation, right? So you can see in the screen now, so the different research questions or the different topics related to each of the experiments. Obviously, this will be the central topic, the central discussion for the, for the remaining presentations later on. Next, please. And here we have the team. Basically, the, the the set of experts together with the GRC staff that provided the the infrastructure and, and mechanisms in order to run the different experiments. Next, please. And you can see actually the big map, right, and the distribution of the different scientific responsibilities and tasks. Uh, in blue, you can you can see actually the the experts and the associated experiment. And in Iran, you can see the GRC staff who was coordinating the different activities and uh, scientific responsibilities and support, support activities as well. Okay, next. And this is basically the, the scientific approach in, and methodology that will be explained later on in the different experiments. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alex and Carlos, uh, to sharing with us this uh, the policy and the scientific aspect of, of the work done. So now it's, now it's time to, to switch to the content part. As mentioned in the beginning, there will be three sections. And each of the sections has a moderator, speakers, and the policy and scientific discussant. So at the beginning of each section, I will leave the floor to the moderator, as I will do at this point for the innovative approaches to data sharing. So I'm inviting Marco Mingini uh, to take over. Please, Marco, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Simon, and welcome everyone from me as well. My name is Marco Mingini. Uh, I work at the JRC of the European Commission. I had the pleasure to moderate this uh, first uh, practical session titled Innovative Approaches to Data Sharing. Um, as you can see in the next slide, in this session, we will first hear three presentations investigating opportunities and challenges around different topics on data sharing and specifically geo data sharing. Um, the first one given by Alessandro Sarretta is on how to make use of a new data source that is citizen generated data and how to address related issues such as quality, availability, uh, and interoperability with data from the public sector. The second talk given by Peter Mooney will address uh, innovative way to uh, encode data, in particular through binary uh, serialization to facilitate data sharing. And then we will move from data to technology and infrastructure with Just van den Broeke, who will show us an experiment to automate and streamline uh, geo data sharing. We will then have a short panel session with the three speakers, and then uh, we will move to Seth van Holland from the uh, Directorate General for Informatics of the European Commission, uh, who will close the session by reflecting a bit on the three presentations and providing some policy uh, insights and takeaway messages. Uh, we will not have time for a discussion with the audience, so I uh, kindly ask everyone to just post your questions uh, in the chat and the experts, uh, the speakers, after their talks will uh, make their best to uh, directly answer uh, them in the chat. And without further waiting, let me immediately uh, give the floor to the first speaker. Um, next slide, please. That is uh, Alessandro Sarreta from the Italian National Research Council, who will discuss about integrating public sector and citizen-generated uh, data. Alessandro, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marco. Uh, hi to everybody. Good afternoon. So we are moving here uh, from the general uh, European data space uh, context to the specific uh, domain of geospatial data and uh, considering uh, what which enables and barriers uh, of the integration between authoritative data set and citizen generated data are um, at the national level, having uh, OpenStreetMap as a, a use case for uh, as the most uh, popular source of citizen generated data in the geospatial domain, uh, trying to have some recommendations on the interoperability at various level for, for the establishment of data spaces. So the um, uh, next slides, please. Please. So we started from uh, uh, from one side. Um, next again, sorry. Uh, from the OpenStreetMap, that's a worldwide project. It's a collaborative project with uh, open data released in a uh, database with a simple flat data model. We have uh, mappers in the in the in communities managed mainly nationally, and then we have uh, selected two datasets uh, on addresses. 
as a simple use case to, to start from uh, in the Finland and uh, the Netherlands, having two different approaches also in sharing uh, official uh, open data um, in Finland through uh, the OGC API features, a standard service with inspired compliant uh, data specification. While in the case of the Netherlands, we have a, uh, selected a more complex format that is not inspired compliant, but again, uh, official and open data. And next slide, please. So we had to um, the objective to make an integrated data set starting from the, the source data. So we uh, compared the, um, the, the two data, the source data, in this case uh, is about uh, Finland and uh, OpenStreetMap, having a unique uh, data model where to put all the data and select uh, the, the, the best of the, of the two words. If we go to the next slide, uh, slide please, so we have implemented a step-by-step -step reproducible workflow with the small steps um, implemented in the QG, QGIS uh, graphical model and open source software quite known in the, in the domain and available in the GitHub repository. And the final uh, point is to have one unique data set having the, the, the best of, of, of the two source information. Next slide, please, again. Uh, of course, the reference data set is the uh, authoritative data set. But the, the way the citizen uh, are organizing and collecting information in the various countries is of course influencing how uh, the OpenStreetMap, in this case, uh, uh, information is contributing or uh, is it compared to the official data set in the two different countries. While in the Finland, the communities are probably more sparse and uh, we have an uneven geographical distribution information. While in the Netherlands, the massive import, uh, continuous imports that are uh, happening uh, allows a, a more um, uh, comparable uh, uh, information between the citizen generated and uh, the official one. But in both cases, uh, we've seen that, in, uh, especially in, in urban areas, where there's a high density population, uh, so more mappers and more updates from uh, the citizen side. Uh, we have, in a few cases, um, uh, OpenStreetMap that's adding more details also compared to the official data set. That's a common thing in uh, specific cases. So if we go to the next uh, slide, uh, we have also discussed with a national and regional agency uh, that already have had uh, experiences in using on the street map with their authoritative data. And uh, we have a few points here. So we have always issues about license incompatibility, even if we're talking about open data on both sides. Uh, it's something that is quite tricky and has to be considered um, carefully when dealing with the uh, geospatial information. Um, Addresses is a simple use case, uh, um, but there are specific topics that are quite of interest depending on the agency dealing with the data. We have examples on hydrography bidding direction that has to be um, carefully um, studied to be integrated, but not only data from citizens are uh, interesting uh, for, for um, governments, but also the tools and technology used by citizens and sometimes developed by them. Uh, has been seen as useful for uh, integrated information, even at the uh, governmental level. And uh, we've seen also one important thing, one of the, um, uh, the, the main aim of the authoritative data set is that citizen could be able to, to use them. And OpenStreetMap has been seen as a way to make it easier to use also official information if they are included in this uh, citizen generated uh, tools and the data sets. Final slide, please. So uh, in the end, uh, knowing the, the process um, the, and the, the, data, the source data set has to be uh, carefully known and prepared to be able to integrate information. But from a technical perspective, it, it is possible, feasible, and can improve both the data sets. It's important to know that Inspire uh, interoperability information can make it easier to integrate uh, at the national level if we want to talk at, at the European level as a common data space. And uh, um, that uh, an integration and collaboration between governments or authoritative uh, institutions and citizens, it's quite important to make this integration easier. Finally, 
uh, this is only one example uh, in one data set. Uh, we have many, many citizen projects and citizen science ecosystems where we can really start to think how they can differently uh, in input these uh, and support various US data spaces. That's all for me. Thank you, Marco, to you. Thank you, Alessandro, for a very uh, short but very concrete and clear uh, presentation. Um, uh, we have time for a very short question, but I would ask you also to uh, answer uh, uh, quickly. Uh, I would like to ask you about one uh, issue that is typical when we deal with citizen-generated data and open street, which is data quality. Usually this is a concern. So can you briefly comment on this? Yes, of course, this is one of the most uh, studied topics also in, for citizen-generated data, but in OpenStreetMap specifically. And we have different level of uh, considerations, especially in different um, contexts, we have different quality levels. We have different studies that are highlighting in that um, in many cases, the quality of information in OpenStreetMap is at least comparable with the official one. Uh, this is true when the community is well organized. There are connections between the community, the citizen, and the scientists or the experts or the government, so that uh, the quality can be improved also from, from uh, the citizen um, point of view. And there are tools to uh, check and implement and validate some information before integrating or um, the information with the authoritative one. So it's ex extremely important to take it in consideration, but uh, it can be done and it can be, uh, the information can be selected so that quality information can be integrated with the authoritative one. Thanks a lot again, Alessandro, for your, your contribution. I see some questions uh, coming in the chat. Of course, for the audience, if you want to know more about this, please uh, refer to the report. There's a full chapter on Alessandro's work. And with this, we can move to the uh, second speaker of the session that uh, it's, uh, it's Peter Mooney. Um, very, uh, a very warm welcome to Peter from Minuth University. Uh, Peter will uh, present another experiment on binary uh, data encodings for geospatial data, static uh, and data. Dynamic. Peter, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marco, and good afternoon, everyone. And I'll just start by, by thanking Marco and Alex and all the team at GRC uh, who, who helped make this a very interesting and uh, informative experience for me. And I want to just go to the next slide and, and talk about the, the practicalities that I think all of us have uh, encountered in exchanging geographic data regardless whether we are client uh, using data or we are someone who is involved at the other end as a data provider. There are many issues around the exchange of geographic data. The incredible thing is that most of this is encapsulated. So we don't really see this as clients. We don't see the complexity behind many of these processes. And it is very easy for us to use the output from uh, such services in JSON, in XML, in CSV, for example. So I'll go to the next slide, please. And this brings us around uh, the, the, the question of, could we consider binary data serialization, which is used in other communities, such as metrology, uh, the climate uh, data community, to provide a realistic alternative as a data exchange which goes beyond the, some of the limitations of, of XML and, and JSON as an exchange. And this isn't just a, a measurement of time versus space, rather it's a, a, a wider consideration about the conditions where binary serialization could replace or even complement the de facto standards we see. After a process of, of research, we decided to concentrate on protocol buffers from Google and Apache Avro as two very popular serialization formats. Next slide. We set up two experiments. Uh, one of the experiments used the data that Alessandro has just mentioned uh, in his work. And the second experiment uses data from a uh, Sensor Things API, which Dr. Simon Yerka will mention in his presentation and in the chapter. We also had a second experiment, experiment 1A, which had a randomly generated data set which had the same attributes 
and structure as uh, the large data set and was provided for re reproducibility purposes. Next slide. So we had a, a workflow, a very, a very simple, uh, easy to follow workflow where we, in both experiments, uh, consumed either the, 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 the geographic data in a static file or from a, an API. We loaded that data into GeoJSON, and then in both cases, we serialized to Apache Avro, or we serialized to protocol buffer, and then we deserialized uh, to get back to the start again and check that everything was as we had expected. In both cases, we have to define the schemas for both Avro and protocol buffer. Next slide, please. And the schemas and all of the software is available in a GitHub repository. Uh, the slides are moving a little bit there. In a, a, a GitHub repository, which the, the link is in front of you there, but also it's inv available in the, the report, which is just published. And this has been written in Python. It's fully reproducible. And we've tried to use open source uh, completely without any hacks. So it's, it's simple code, uh, which, provides the implementation of the workflow. Next slide, please. And just a, a screenshot of the schemas. The schemas are quite straightforward because both of the data sets and data formats are, are fly, fl flat file structures, which are, are easy to uh, implement in both of these schemas. Next slide. So our, our, our experiments, our experimental results are, are provided here. And what we have looked at is the timing on the serialization and the deserialization process for both of our experiments. And I'll take this next slide, please. And the results again for experiment two. And I urge you to have a look at the report to read in more detail about the, 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 the quantitative values you see here. But the next slide has some summary details that we found in terms of overall file size, the binary files were indeed smaller than, than our input. Uh, geo packages or geo JSON. And in terms of timing, in experiment one, because of the large file that we were dealing with, uh, there was no real timing differences observed. But in experiment two, when we were dealing with the API, we found that serialization to binary was, was indeed three times, three, almost four times faster than serialization to geo JSON. So to wrap up, next slide. There are a couple of practical results that we have to consider that the binary data will always require us to define a schema. So it's not just as easy as we know, just simply downloading some GeoJSON and, and opening it in our GIS or in our Python or, or Java uh, code. This means that it will require specialist code to be written. We can avoid vendor lock-in because of the open source support for this, but specialist knowledge is required. And as data models change for data providers, schemas will need to be uh, updated. So finally, the next slide. So overall, there's a couple of important lessons. It's still very challenging for us to measure and understand what success means here. There are quantifiable performance advantages, but some of the overheads, such as schema updating, the specialist knowledge, quite a small worldwide user community to uh, support at the moment. And this asks us to look into more specific experimentation for geolocation data in these uh, situations. So next slide, which is my last slide. So thank you very much for your uh, consideration. And again, to the JRC for this uh, excellent opportunity. Thank you, Peter, for your uh, experiment and for your very quick uh, and concise presentation, and also for mentioning reproducibility, also as, as well as Alessandra, as a key feature of sandboxing. This is key for all the works that will be presented also later on. One uh, quick question and one quick answer, please, for you as well. Um, in your opinion, what uh, uh, will be the most important factor that will cause the future to turn away from the de facto approaches that are JSON uh, XML towards binary data serialization? So I think, Marco, there, there isn't, uh, as I said in the previous slide, there's, there is not a single factor that, that I can identify, but rather it will be a, a, a combination. And we're not sure of the weighting of, of the various variables into that combination, but it, it will, 
certainly be focused around when binary data serialization and consumption of the binary data becomes as in quotes easy as it is at the moment for GeoJSON and JSON in our software, in our GIS packages, in our JavaScript frameworks, etc. So we see an example in the OpenStreetMap community where they are providing their data in binary data format and a very large user community of tools and expertise has built up, making it very, very easy now to consume OpenStreetMap data. So I think the, the way forward is for a, a, a combination of community tools and data providers to uh, chart the way forward for us. Thanks a lot, Peter, uh, again, for your work. And again, uh, you can find all the details about this um, interesting experiment uh, in the report. And with this, we can move to our last speaker for this session that is Just van den Broeke from osgeo.nl in the Netherlands. Uh, Just will uh, uh, present an, an experiment on uh, an innovative infrastructure to facilitate to streamline uh, geodata uh, sharing. Uh, Just the floor uh, is yours. Yes, thank you, uh, Marco, and, and to the GRC for organizing this uh, project and this webinar. Um, yeah, as you can see in the title, it's quite a mouthful, but I, I, I will talk about the result. Um, basically, the result of this activity is a, a, a running surface, a data surface, where we use the uh, data provided in the other activity uh, just presented by Alessandro, mainly the uh, an ad, a set of addresses. Um, and the, and the service is actually running. You can, you can find the details in the in the report and it's a, in a GitHub repository. I wanted to, to mention that first. So the, there were three um, basic challenges to this, this activity, but you see the first one is trying through is the first one as well, which standard should we choose? But the, the standard was more or less already uh, chosen. There's a set of new OGC APIs um, for geospatial data, and one of them is features. You could see it as the sort of the follow-up of uh, the web feature service. So we we chosen this this service, and the next two challenges here is is okay. If we, we choose that service, which products uh, should we choose, and 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 not just the product, but basically build up a a stack to for data uh, serving, and and the last one. Is, is how to realize um, yeah, what you could call deployment in the clouds. Um, so we'll expand from here. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, we, we didn't want to, to start from scratch, but also and not to reinvent the wheel, but look at current trends and best practices. Um, and also this year at Geonovum from the Netherlands, where I'm also from, um, uh, an activity was performed to test what is called the OGC API test bed to, to um, uh, use different implement, open source implementations of the OGC API feature standards, uh, compare them, but also how to um, connect to different kinds of data sources, what you see in the bottom, like post GIS, geo package, or even provide a proxy for remote existing remote services as, as, as an upgrade path. And uh, at the top, you see the traffic proxy because once you provide a data service on the internet, you, you need several things. You may need routing, load uh, balancing, um, SSL, so secure, um, let's say HTTPS and more. And there we've chosen traffic. So this is the, the um, overall architecture and of course as a containerization technology we use uh, use docker so we took this and we we went further with pygu api um, as it is also the the otc reference implementation for otc api features and i should also say for other otc apis like for tiles and, and metadata um, next slide please um, so once you want to deploy, uh, let's say a data service, you could do that all by hand and, and go to uh, a server and install everything. But we uh, wanted to uh, apply 
let's say, a, a, an automation for deployment and an automation for continuous deployment. And the, the, the current, uh, one of the most current, uh, let's say, uh, popular uh, ways to do that is what is called um, GitOps. And uh, so what it means is that you have all your uh, configuration and software in a Git repository. And that, that contains the truth. It's a way of implementing continuous deployment. And every change you make in Git uh, triggers a build and a test deploy in the cloud. That's, that's the overall picture. And the next uh, slide, I will expand on this. This is what we actually, um, this is the workflow basically that we, we applied here. So we start at the left, you have the developer with the local environment. And he or she pushes changes to what we use GitHub, but GitOps is not specifically tied to GitHub, but you can use any kind of Git uh, provider. We use GitHub. Um, that triggers actions within GitHub, and we used Ansible. Ansible is, is yeah, a software automation configuration tool maintained by, by Red Hat, but it's all open source. And that triggers a remote deployment on a server virtual machine. And then that uh, implies the whole stack. And, and, and we use Docker there. And well, the beauty, I should say, of this scheme is that you never need to go manually to, to any of the servers, but you basically focus on your local uh, development in local environment and you push changes to GitHub and, and in Git, the whole truth is there, including, um, let's say, uh, also uh, encrypted security um, tokens and, and further. So that's 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 what we call GitOps. Um, probably next uh, slide. So you will find all details in the full report. So our our finding was that that what we call GitOps is a very viable. Uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment, data service deployment strategy. And it, it, it's used already worldwide by many organizations. Um, but it's also, also quite a, a, let's say, a challenge to start. So yeah, what we applied is what you could call a lightweight GitOps because GitOps is usually tied to Kubernetes. Um, but we have used GitHub in combination with Ansible and Docker, which is quite lightweight. But ultimately, um, I think uh, Kubernetes is sort of the, the, the uh, well, I wouldn't say the final solution, but it's, it's the most uh, popular or solution, but it has uh, quite a steep learning curve. And of course, Kubernetes can be uh, applied best with, with also with GitHub's. Um, yes. Um, this is a very short uh, presentation of our activity. So in the end, we have a running service for the addresses. Maybe I can also mention that um, the OTC APIs are tied to GeoJSON, but there are many other encodings possible. There's a way of content negotiation. So I was just thinking that while Peter was presenting, that could be an interesting uh, follow-up there. So this, this concludes my presentation here. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks a lot, Just for an extremely interesting uh, work. Uh, I have a question for you, but uh, I would require a very quick answer. And uh, I would say on that slide, um, uh, where you say that basically Kubernetes combined with GitOps uh, is the ultimate CI and CD uh, deployment solution. But what would be needed for data providers to make that? Uh, transition yes that, that that's a good question because yeah there's basically two things tied to 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 this first of all uh kubernetes has to be adopted by the organization it has a, quite a steep learning curve there's quite some options still so that's uh, yeah the, the organization has to prepare and the second thing with kubernetes is that it's often what you see now tied to, because you need to have sort of Kubernetes running, you need to maintain it, upgrade it, security patches. And often um, the best, yeah, the way to is have a Kubernetes provider, but currently the, 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 the main Kubernetes providers are 
basically from what you could call the big tech, Google, uh, Microsoft, Azure, and uh, Amazon. So the challenges in, in, let's say, in Europe, how for organizations, um, yeah, how to, how, how to best do the hosting basically for Kubernetes. Um, we see also other providers, and that's yeah, basically the two challenges I would say to to adopt Kubernetes. Thank you, uh, Yust, and apologies for cutting uh, a bit uh, uh, you. Uh, let's move quickly to the panel now. And I would invite again Alessandro and Peter also to uh, uh, turn on their videos uh, again um, for just a question. Um, we can, Simon, we can, keen, we can still uh, stay on the previous one. And uh, I would just ask maybe the same question that is a general one, but I would invite Alessandro, Peter, and Yust to share their thoughts uh, uh, again uh, in, in one minute or so. Um, the title of this session was Innovative Approaches for Data Sharing. Of course, the fact that they are innovative today doesn't mean that uh, they will automatically be widespread in the, in the future. So I would ask you, what do you think are the main challenges for a widespread adoption? And most important, which mechanisms like legal frameworks or standards or new technologies or new partnerships would help to foster the adoption? And let's start again from Alessandro and then Peter and, and then you, Alessandro. Yeah, th thank you, Marco. Yeah, of course, the, 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 the test that, the, that we have started here and many other exercises that are happening and the, the topic of the integration of citizen uh, information and authority one um, is not uh, concluded and, and, and it's something that is changing because we are learning about um, how and and what and how citizens can contribute with more uh, technical tools that are more and more a, a improving the way citizens are contributing to various uh, sizes of the of science and, 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 and society. So I think uh, um, one important thing is to be aware that uh, how we collect and the information is, is um, challenging how we are able to include and integrate them with other sources. So both the, the formats, but uh, even how we are sharing the information. So the licensing um, issue is, is a quite a big one that can be um, uh, tackled with a, a common approach, probably at, at least at the European level with some uh, recommendation on which licenses or which uh, policies should be given to both authoritative, but also citizen-generated data. And another aspect is uh, what you were mentioning, so partnership or a collaboration uh, exercise initiative between the official uh, governments or institutions and uh, the citizen or the projects, the, the, the communities that are uh, behind the, the citizen that are contributing in certain topics. In this way, I think that uh, um, we, we, we have to really uh, increase and, uh, and um, ease the way we are uh, connecting these two words. So uh, any initiative that could really uh, make these two words collaborate more, it's really useful to be able to collect the data in the same way or to find different way to use the data. And so enrich the, the, the power of uh, contributing to those data spaces that we are just trying to uh, to create now, but if we start with a, the, the some ground uh, basis, I think it, it's it would be really useful to 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 uh, to collect all the different types of information that are coming from the different citizen science uh, and citizen generated uh, projects. Uh, so thanks, these two elements probably are, are the, the, the first ones. Thanks a lot, Alessandro. Apologies, we need to move on, Peter. Thanks, Marco. I, th I think uh, we, we, we're at the beginning of a long journey and, and every step brings us closer to the, to the destination. And if you think about it, the way technology works, uh, what just presented just before us would not have been possible maybe five or 10 years ago. So maybe the scale we're looking at in the future is maybe five and 10 years in the future. But I think there's a, a, there's a need for data providers to champion uh, change around the delivery of, of, of data, be it in uh, binary data serialization. There's the semantics community who can help us in making the transformations uh, much more seamless. And then, of course, there's all of the open communities that are eager to be involved, the software developers, uh, the service providers, etc., who can make it much easier for everyone 
to become involved in, in exchange of data. And I suppose it's a win-win for everybody that as data gets larger and, and we require more real-time data, uh, there's, it's a win-win scenario if this can be improved. So I think there's more opportunity for research in this area, but I think every step we, we go forward brings us, brings us closer to uh, you know, a better outcome for us all in this kind of data space environment. Okay, thanks a lot. Apologies, used. I will cut you in a way because we are going late. And I would uh, take the chance to give immediately the floor, the floor to Seth. Um, uh, in the next slide, we have the introduction to Seth, uh, that is from the Director General for Informatics uh, of the Commission. Um, uh, Seth, welcome to, to the webinar. And uh, I would ask you for some uh, reflections on the three presentations, the links uh, with your work in Digit, and also some policy uh, takeaways. Uh, in, in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. As I just had to switch from my EC laptop to my iPad because my laptop crashed. Can you hear me correctly? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, perfect. So first and foremost, uh, thanks a lot, uh, I would say, to Alessandro, Peter, and just for uh, three really uh important uh, projects and research investigations i think this is exactly what the the commission needs at this stage uh when discussing the data spaces i don't know if some of you have seen this tweet from alberto abea from fireware last week where he was using the metaphor of the emperor has no clothes in the database uh, in the data spaces discussion i think across um, across the landscape uh, people really realize that we need more, I would say, uh, pragmatic thinking when debating about the uh, data spaces. At this stage, there is not sufficient consensus or ideas on, I would say, the technical technological levels uh, and different layers that we need to mobilize to make data spaces reality. And uh, it's also for that that I uh, tremendously like the uh, the idea of uh, Alex and Sven of the JRC uh, Data Spaces Cookbook, which is a tremendously uh, important initiative. And so I think throughout the three presentations that we've uh, listened to, uh, for, and for, uh, for and foremost, the, uh, the reproducibility aspect is really important. The fact that uh, across the projects, there are uh, really specific data sets which can be reused, which can be built upon, are extremely important uh, to make use, of course, of just open platforms like GitHub, uh, which aren't sitting uh, behind an EU login uh, wall, are uh, really important so that students, researchers, etc., everyone can has access to them. And to just make a little bit the connection to the, the work that we are doing. So now as we move from the IC Square to the DEP working program, we are in close collaboration with Sven and Alex uh, thinking about how I would say we can really facilitate um, a bottom-up approach when thinking and redesigning uh, semantic specifications. Um, and in, I think, the first week of April, for example, here with uh, uh, Interoperable Europe Unit, we will facilitate a workshop, for example, a practical workshop on how to make use of Wikibase and Wikidata uh, by public administrations. So I can only tremendously encourage this uh, initiative of showing real life projects which can be reproduced with open codes, etc. And uh, this is def definitely a strand which we will we'll embed in the months and in the, the years to come under the, the DEP uh, financing program. Voila, Marco, this was just a quick note from my side. Back over to you. Thank you. It was quick, but really interesting. And I'm sorry we do not have time to continue this uh, conversation here. But of course, I invite everyone to continue it uh, in the uh, chat. Apologies again, especially to you for being the bad cop here, having to moderate this uh, discussion. It's uh, uh, it's not uh, 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 nice, I know, to, to, to stop when things are so interesting. But in the interest of time, we need to move on. So I will hand over uh, to uh, Simon uh, and to my colleagues for the next session. But uh, let me thank once more. For, uh, all the three speakers and set for their uh, input and contributions. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Thank you to all the speakers. 
we are just a bit uh, behind of uh, the schedule, so I will just quickly invite the next moderator for the session on IoT and the centralized architecture. So please, Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Simon and colleagues. We have two very interesting presentations ahead of us. Uh, the topic uh, uh, has to do with uh, dynamic data, uh, so Internet of Things uh, data, where there are many opportunities, as we know, having to do with completely new use cases uh, that are based on spatiotemporal dynamic uh, data. We know that uh, the uh, volumes of data that are generated uh, uh, in the, by the IoT is exponentially growing. So we can develop uh, things like personal digital twins, uh, have AI reinforced uh, automated decision uh, making processes and really uh, IoT can uh, change uh, considerably the ways in which we are uh, using uh, the data. But at the same time, there are challenges the, uh, that uh, relate to the huge uh, volumes of the data. In many of the use cases, storing the data from the IoT simply makes no sense. Then connectivity, the infrastructures are important. Uh, we uh, still see lots of issues uh, relating to uh, the network uh, latency, as well as uh, data interoperability. We call it uh, Internet of Things, but uh, maybe there are currently many Internets of Things because interoperability is a real uh, barrier towards uh, uh, utilizing the full potential of the IoT. Uh, the, the, these kind of topics, uh, what can we do and uh, how we can do it in an IoT setting, we're uh, try, trying to address uh, with our next two presentations. The first one will be delivered by uh, our colleague Frank Osterman from the University of Twente, who will talk about processing data close to its origin, so uh, uh, close to the network edge. Uh, over to you, Frank. Thank you very much, Alex. Thanks for having me and welcome to this presentation. So you already introduced me and the topic. Um, so what's left? Well, why this background image? Um, the case study that I investigated is about detecting and reporting noise pollution, um, in particular traffic noise. So there you have the link. Um, next slide, please. So. Um, Let's just give a little bit of context. Here you have what a citizen might want. Uh, we would like uh, transparency and uh, privacy and control over our data. Uh, next, please. Unfortunately, that's not uh, what we always got. So there is a mismatch. And um, next, please. Um, this work is trying to address this mismatch um, because the Internet of Things has opportunities, but also additional uh, security issues. Yes, next, please. So what is edge computing? Um, essentially, it's about moving um, the processing of data towards the edge of the network to save bandwidth and to reduce latency. And uh, although we have uh, much more bandwidth now than we ever had, we also have much more data. So this continues to be a concern. Next, please. So if no data leaves the edge node, this would help to preserve privacy of end users and control increases their control. However, this of course implies that we do the data analysis on the edge node. Um, as an additional benefit, if we use entirely open source libraries and open hardware, this also improves transparency and security. Next, please. So this work um, uses the Arduino Nano 33 BLE Sense which runs a TensorFlow light artificial neural network to detect and report events, more on this in the next slides. And via Bluetooth low energy, transmits all of this to a Raspberry Pi, which then can uh, collect data from several nodes and publishes them on the internet. Next, please. Uh, so why noise pollution? Um, because the ongoing effects um, will probably um, only emerge in the, in the coming decades. Um, there are already hints that noise pollution has significant impact on human health. And so this is a concern. Next, please. Problem is it's difficult to measure. Uh, we usually measure it in decibels just by volume, but you have different types of noise, um, which have different uh, ways of uh, impacting you. Um, you have subjective uh, assessments of noise. 
one person's noise is the other person's uh, um, joy. So um, additionally, in urban environments, the diffusion of sound is highly dependent on the morphology, the surface type of uh, buildings and the shape. Of course, constantly recording sound intrudes privacy. So next, please. Um, so then we can uh, maybe address this with using machine learning on IoT devices, right? So this is an overview of um, the workflow of the experiments. Um, I don't have the time to go into detail here. Let's just say, so if we start in the upper left, we have the input, which is uh, environmental sound data, which is uh, also publicly available. TensorFlow Lite um, examples and code, which is also publicly available. And of course, there was some work necessary to make this um, happen on an Arduino lots of model training and retraining. And um, the core of this work you see in the Arduino Nano BLE sense box, where uh, a noise event detector runs inferences on what the um, hardware listens to. And if a noise is detected, then it notifies the Raspberry. Next, please. And next. So what you see here is on the right hand side is just the main loop for um, what is happening in the noise event detector box. So after connecting, um, audio samples are collected and transformed um, into spectrograms, which then the TensorFlow Light interpreter can um, analyze and classify. And if something is detected, then LEDs blink and BLE notifications are sent out. Next, please. So um, I tried several different models using several different noise classes, which you see here. For the final um, implementation, the fourth model was chosen helicopter and siren um, because these were relatively well to distinguish. Uh, you see the metrics here from the computational validation. So overall accuracy 0.9, well, pretty good. Also the other metrics are quite good, but, and the but you'll see on the next, Slide, please. So the lessons learned. Obviously traffic events, some are more difficult to detect than others. For some, adding background noise actually improves the performance, for others it decreases them. A main concern is the uh, false discovery rate. So even if that is low, as you've seen in the previous slide, because so many inferences are being run, such a high frequency, you will still have lots of false alarms. Additionally, the deployed model um, performs worse in the lab than during the computational training validation. And this is likely due to hardware issues. For example, the microphone may be not generating uh, the, the best um, input data for, for the spectrograms. However, and that's the, the conclusion of my talk, all of these issues can be addressed by further development, new uh, and better training data, tweaking of model hyperparameters, cascading design, for example. So having a lightweight, quick model, um, which if it notifies a noise event, then starts a more elaborate and more sophisticated model for uh, removing all those false positives. And of course, more sophisticated responder logic and so forth. And there are plenty of other use cases possible. So that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening and looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Frank. Fascinating and really so many interesting use cases come to mind uh, when, when listening to you. I have one question uh, for you, which relates to the trust in, in, in the data that is being calculated close to the network edge. If we want, for instance, to be using such data for decision support purposes, we need to trust the data. Um, so uh, how would you uh, approach uh, uh, that, uh, for instance, developing some sort of a reputation index uh, for the different uh, sensor nodes or something else? If you can elaborate on that, it would be great. Sure, um, that's a crucial question. Um, that we need to address. And the first step to do that is to be as transparent and reproducible as possible. And uh, so as the other projects as well, this data 
this model is available on GitHub. And the input data is also, it's freely available. Um, everyone can try it out and see how it works. So that's uh, the basic approach, uh, credibility, trustworthiness through transparency. And um, also the output of the, the generated inference, uh, you can monitor it, right? So, of course, you could, uh, for example, try to tamper with this um, by, for example, placing a, a loudspeaker next to the device and just running the sounds that you wanted to report. And here, the, the other node comes in, the Raspberry, um, because ideally, you would then, you would combine several Arduinos within uh, a larger area, and the Raspberry Pi could then, for example, compare what is being reported and try to filter out obviously wrong um, reports. Excellent. Many thanks, Frank, uh, for your concise uh, answer. Now we move on to the second presentation in our uh, small session, which has to do with uh, the ways in which we exchange data between the different uh, layers, between the, the sensors, uh, net network uh, edge, uh, but, but, but also to the cloud. Uh, over to our colleague Simon Irka from 52 degrees north to present on event-driven architectures for the data exchange. Yes, Alex, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And as Alex mentioned, I would like to uh, talk a bit about uh, protocols uh, for delivering data in different modes uh, in case of uh, sensor data. Perhaps we can go to the next slide. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, so the traditional uh, 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 communication pattern that we are using in many spatial data infrastructure acti activities, uh, for example, also typically in Inspire, for example, is a request response pattern. That means typically a client is asking a data server for data and the server uh, responds then uh, with the corresponding data that was requested. Um, that works for many use cases quite well. So it has been proven a lot, but when we are moving now to more dynamic applications, like from the internet of things domain dealing with, uh, for example, uh, sensor data streams, um, then uh, depending on the goals that we have, uh, such a, a, a pool-based approach may not always be optimal. So for example, uh, if we want to have low latency, uh, we would like to have a low latency in the receiving new information. Uh, the assumption is then uh, that uh, such a pool-based approach may uh, require uh, 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 yeah, a more uh, uh, data traffic, more requests, for example. And the alternative pattern, Perhaps if you could go oops, uh, back one, one more again, okay. Um, then uh, uh, the alternative that we wanted to uh, yeah, compare here and de determine when we uh, may, for example, have advantages by using a push-based approach. That means we have a broker like uh, MQTT, which is a protocol example for this. Uh, and we wanted to uh, check or to ask the question, uh, in which cases do we have advantages by relying on push-based communication and which uh, 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 scenarios may be uh, especially suitable for such push communication. So you now to the next slide, please. Um, so what we did is uh, we were thinking about uh, a data experiment, uh, an experiment where we wanted to uh, work with some real world data. Um, so we had some requirements uh, depending on the use case that we had in mind. We wanted to have dynamic data, that means data which is uh, uh, somehow changing continuously to, to a certain degree. Uh, we wanted to have uh, uh, an update frequency, which is also uh, quite high. Uh, may not be constant, but uh, at least high. And as I said, we wanted to have real world data. And for this purpose, um, we also used uh, a Raspberry Pi as a base station. And the data stream that we were looking at was uh, flight tracking data. So uh, we uh, made uh, set up a Raspberry Pi uh, uh, collecting uh, ADSD data, which is a uh, yeah, broadcast uh, format, broadcast protocol in order to push information about uh, flights in the uh, area of reception of the receiver. And then uh, we yeah, pushed this into our infrastructure. We compared this with the Center of Things API as a pool based interface. So we wanted to basically provide our data with these two different uh, 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 methods. And that for the deployment, we basically used an uh, Amazon AWS EKS cluster. So running all the stuff in Kubernetes. So next slide, please. 
um, in order to evaluate and put uh, together or compare these protocols, um, we define certain criteria which we wanted to look at. So one aspect was server load for answering incoming requests uh, uh, or for pushing data to existing subscribers. Um, we were also uh, looking at the number of requests. This especially concerns the push-based approach because there we have to check how often do clients ask how many requests for new data do we receive at the server. Um, how many requests of how many of those requests which we are sending do re, re, uh, uh, lead to new information which is uh, sent back to the uh, consumer and also looking at the data volume which is transferred and at the same time uh, we were uh, looking at uh, certain influencing variables which we first have chosen uh, in, in order to uh, yeah, uh, run our, our experiments so the number of tracked aircrafts for example or uh, especially also for the pool based access, uh, the time interval for checking data. Updates. So our assumption was um, with a push based approach, we can uh, deliver data immediately to all subscribers, while for the push based approach, we continuously need to request for data updates. And depending on uh, the request interval, uh, we either increase the number of requests or increase uh, or, uh, or decrease our latency. So perhaps we can go to the next slide. And uh, here's just an overview of some uh, results that we uh, 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 made. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't include here a, a bit further information about the setup here. Uh, this was uh, uh, some server load uh, observations which we generated uh, on, on the left side uh, for pool-based access, right-hand side for push-based data access. Uh, in this case, it was about 32 tracked aircrafts with 32 subscribers or 32 data consumers. Uh, the general impression here is that the server load was in a similar range. Um, however, we, we saw some spikes at the beginning, uh, but these were mainly also a result of the protocols which were used because in the beginning uh, of our process, we had to um, yeah, consider also or retrieve information about all available uh, 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 airplanes in our region of coverage and then receive the initial information for this. So that's a bit uh, related to the protocol. Uh, for the numbers uh, of uh, uh, tracked objects and users, uh, we didn't uh, observe such a big difference. However, uh, we are expecting um, our limit, limit, limiting factor here was a bit uh, the, um, uh, the uh, amount of uh, client requests that we were able to send simultaneously. If we scale this up, however, we were expecting to get a bit more differentiation uh, for the data, but this is a uh, part of future work. So if we go to the next slide, um, then the other aspect was the data volume. Uh, here we compared basically, uh, or wanted to, to, uh, to determine how much redundant information has been uh, 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 transmitted. So uh, how much redundant requests have been issued, how much redundant data volume was uh, 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 transmitted in order to uh, to um, yeah, uh, get the most updated information to the user. These two diagrams basically show the results. And you see here uh, on the uh, uh, x-axis, uh, the update intervals so and the request interval in milliseconds. So these diagrams represent the status for pool-based data access. And we see, uh, which is quite ob obvious to, uh, obvious to uh, uh, expect that with the uh, amount uh, or with a reduced interval, if we, if we have, want to have shorter update intervals, then uh, of course, the uh, uh, amount of redundant requests and the amount of data volume uh, is increasing uh, simply because uh, the more often you ask the server, the more likely it is uh, that no new information is available. Um, so we are discussing this a bit more in our paper and uh, perhaps just a couple of conclusions because I cannot go really into the details of all this and we observe uh, quite a lot of uh, 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 further uh, uh, aspects which also are influencing this. So it's quite interesting what comes out uh, also as new questions from this. But in general, the, our uh, 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 idea was, or our result uh, are uh, that uh, with push-based data access, we see especially uh, uh, good use cases in place where we have data streams which have irregular updates with non-predictable update frequency. Here, uh, push-based uh, data access is really advantageous. 
Di ano, ang John. So then, uh, for a large number of data streams which are not continuously up updated, uh, in this case, uh, also there, uh, we had uh, a, a good result uh, as, uh, as well as for um, data updates. If we want to really decrease the latency in which data is delivered, then the push-based approach was really uh, showed some advantages. Uh, for pool-based, uh, this has also good use cases. So if you are accessing subsets of data archives, so we have collected all this airplane data and wanted to access subsets, then uh, uh, pool-based access with uh, filter options was really advantageous. Uh, if you want to download complete predefined data sets or uh, data for fixed time intervals. So both protocols basically have their good use cases. Um, they are complementary and the recommendation that we derived was really um, that uh, also push-based communication may be a valuable option to uh, complement the existing protocols which we have in the existing data infrastructures. And with that, I would like to close and uh, would like to check if there are any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. As we experienced, the noise pollution is a real phenomenon which is uh, re really valid in multiple uh, contexts. Uh, quick question for you, uh, also expecting a quick uh, answer. So in, in your analysis, you have focused on uh, data volume, the number of messages and server load as the evaluation metrics. Do you see further aspects which should be considered when choosing the best suitable communication pattern? Yes, uh, so uh, I think um, we, uh, with using this real world data from the airplanes, uh, we discovered that there are more aspects uh, which we uh, uh, would re uh, need to dive in. Um, so, for example, uh, the irregularities of the data, also considering that uh, the uh, share of data streams, for example, uh, which are updated at one time. So we have many airplanes which are out of range, so we do not need to ask them, uh, I'll check continuously for updates, but as soon as an airplane arrives, we are needing the updates. So uh, there are further questions which should be investigated and where we were able to yeah, touch some, some uh, basic uh, ideas, but uh, for recommending the best protocol, the best possible setup, I think a bit uh, further work and more systematic approach to uh, summarize all these different uh, things of, and looking also to further use cases to be recommended. Thank you. So more, more research is needed in order to understand push-based or pull-based or a hybrid uh, of some sort. Thank you very much. I see that uh, Frank has already turned uh, his camera on. Thank you. One question. So we have this mini panel now. Uh, maybe we start with, with Frank and then quickly to Simon again. I would like to uh, elaborate very quickly on the topic about interoperability of data in the uh, uh, IoT. The IoT landscape is fragmented and uh, uh, I, the, the interoperability poses a ser serious barrier to, to uh, leveraging the full potential of those use cases that you uh, uh, presented. So which kind of instruments, uh, uh, legal, organizational or, or technical, can we use in order to overcome the challenge? Quickly, I know it's a big uh, question, but just give some hints on where to look. It's, it's indeed a very big question. Um, and my oversimplified answer would be um, to not try to establish uh, new standards, but build on the solutions that are already there. There are open standards which allow very different, different solutions to talk to each other. And um, we've seen a couple of those in, in the talks here as well. So by uh, focusing on those, supporting those, uh, you would be supporting the ecosystem behind that. And uh, hopefully then this will emerge as the, the most widely used, for example. Thank you, Frank. Uh, good suggestion. I'm with you. We have probably too many standards, so we really need to select and uh, identify and develop new standards only if absolutely uh, needed. But Simon, over to you. What do you think mm -hmm. about that? How do we deal with interoperability? Yes, so uh, indeed, um, I think um, there are good mainstream technologies out there which are really useful. And a recommendation would be instead of trying to develop new standards um, that uh, best practice guidance using these standards. So having uh, best practice uh, uh, descriptions, how to solve certain use cases with specific technologies which are established in the uh, IT community, um, that may be a more efficient way uh, ahead. 
uh, because then uh, you would be faster in getting some recommendations out there and at the same time uh, would also rely on proven technologies in, instead of doing too much uh, development on your own because there's much out there which could be reduced. Indeed, and uh, yeah, standards that are not supported by technology, I guess, are of very little uh, use. And thanks for uh, your um, answer here. I think perfect transition to uh, our dear colleague uh, and friend Andrea Halmos from DG Connect, actively working on smart cities and communities. So, Andrea, tell us what, what you make out of the, the, the findings of our uh, two pre presenters uh, from Thank a science you. and policy perspective. Mm. Thank you very much for the invitation and for these uh, excellent presentations. They're extremely relevant to indeed smart cities and communities where we uh, certainly see the very important use of, of uh, geospatial data, both static but also dynamic. And so when you discuss the, um, uh, the idea that of course a lot of that data could be um, handled on the edge, that's uh, very much relevant for a lot of the operational quick decisions, especially um, at, at, in, in local levels, right? Traffic management and so on. So I think that's, that's something that we're definitely uh, looking into and just as much as the event um, driven approaches where we see See the potential usage of such cross-domain um, quick decisions in particular, for example, in the case of using uh, decision-making tools such as digital twins in a local context where this will be extremely helpful. So uh, I think these examples will prove to be very inspirational also for those that will be working on developing a data space for smart cities and communities. As mentioned earlier by Alex, there is an in initiative or incentive to, to create uh, European database going through uh, several uh, sectoral data spaces and the smart communities data space has proven to be important because it's not really sectoral but uses a lot of different data from a lot of different sources and so under the digital program we will be funding the creation of uh, the governance, the uh, architecture, and the, necessarily the starting sets of data to create that data space, and we'll have some funding to validate those in cross-domain contexts. We will also have some funding to create a toolbox for local digital twins that could then be reused by cities that would like to put in place some generic tools and modular ways to start experimenting with these decision-making tools. So overall, in the first two years of the digital work program, we will have about 60 million euros to to uh, spend on this and so we'll, I'll share in the in the chat the link to the info day where all this was explained. As regards IoT, just to let uh, those know who are in the uh, interested, the Digital Europe program will also have about 204 million euros for IoT, cloud to edge infrastructure and services. Sorry, it's more about the cloud to edge uh, services uh, for large scale pilots, marketplace and testing and experimentation facilities. And also um, importantly, the Connecting Europe facilities will have some funding on that. For IoT related topics, please look in the Horizon uh, Europe work program. So thanks a lot for that, extremely uh, relevant and helpful for smart cities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Happy to hear that uh, those uh, findings can inform the, the different uh, very, very important developments for operationalizing and filling the concept of data spaces with the real substance. Glad, glad to hear that uh, this is the case. And of course, looking forward to continuing to work uh, with you and uh, all colleagues in DigiConnect on those topics. That said, uh, Simon, uh, back to you. And many thanks to uh, our two presenters and to Andrea uh, for the uh, interventions. Thank you, Alex. Thanks to you. Thanks to the speaker and to the to Andrea as well. And we are moving now to the, our last uh, content section uh, of the report. So that the social and organizational uh, dimension of data with another three presentations. Uh, and uh, the panel, which will be moderated by our colleague Sven Schade. Please, Sven, uh, the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. Uh, and welcome also from my side to our third mini panel, uh, which is indeed on social and organizational dimensions of data. So we will really change our perspective now really to uh, the emerging governance models of and with data. And also here we have an exciting lineup of distinguished speakers. Uh, and we will begin with Stefan Verhulst from the GovLab uh, in New York. 
uh, and he will basically introduce us into possibilities of public-private partnerships uh, on supplying data, and he will introduce a particular case study on urban uh, air quality. And after that, we will actually uh, step back and ask ourselves a bit more about the actual need and demand for data-driven innovation and where this may come from. Uh, and this work was carried out by Lina Denchik from Cardiff, from the Data Justice Lab, but it will be presented by our very own uh, Marina Micheli from the JRC. Uh, and last but not least, we will then actually carry on and add the last piece to the puzzle with Hillen uh, van Oost, uh, which is basically uh, from Frutura Nova, and he will actually explain us uh, a bit more a pan-European perspective on policies and connect them to the municipal level. So we we'll really have uh, an extremely interesting lineup here. And at the, at the very end, we will then hear from Federica uh, from Eurocities uh, to actually uh, take us a, a bit out of this larger setting and share her takeaways with us. So without further ado, um, fasten your seat belts. Here we go. I hand over to Stefan for the first intervention. Stefan, please. Great. Thanks so much, Sven. And thanks, everyone, for uh, this amazing uh, webinar. And uh, it's also for the way it is structured, because I think a lot of what I will say actually is, um, uh, is complementary to what was discussed earlier, but more from a governance and social technical uh, point of view. And so what um, I've uh, tried to uh, focus on is really to think about how do we scale data collaboration and new kinds of partnership models as it relates to air quality and the use of IoT data to identify areas for possible intervention. And uh, obviously air pollution in cities is a well-known uh, challenge. Quite often air pollution is uh, considered to be the silent killer many communities because it's obviously not that visible uh, uh, quite often, but the impact is massive. And uh, in 2018, some of the latest statistics have already identified that, for instance, more than almost 400 premature deaths in Europe alone, and especially in cities, uh, were connected to air pollution. Now, we do know ways to tackle air pollution, but obviously in order to steer interventions, we actually do need to have a lot more granular data to understand where the problems re uh, reside and how do we then subsequently go about this. And that's of course, next slide, what many of you already have talked about, that's where new kinds of sensors and innovation in data collection uh, comes in. And obviously, especially in the air quality and especially at the city level, we've seen a massive adoption um, of actually the use of Internet of Things enabled air quality sensors. And that is both uh, at the community level where we've seen a lot of uh, crowdsourcing of data using those sensors, but also we've seen a lot of new uh, startups and private corporations being uh, established that provide those services uh, to cities. Now, the key challenge, of course, is how do we then have access to the data and how do we stimulate use of the data that can support communities in the decision making and that can support individuals really to understand what is the current state of air pollution in their environment so that they can take subsequent action as well. And that's next slide is where, uh, from our point of view, we not only need technological innovation, we also need innovation at the organizational and at the governance level. And some of the solutions to the challenge for access and the challenge for indeed the use of the data that is collected is more institutional. And uh, that's where data collaboratives comes in because data collaboratives is a new kind of innovation in public-private partnership models that can allow for more accurate decision-making, it can allow, allow for better research and prediction and forecasting, and a delay a based, is based upon a notion of collaboration and multi-stakeholder uh, partnerships uh, to a large extent. Now, data collaboration and collaboratives can take many forms, and obviously data spaces is one manifestation of a data collaboration. Next slide. But the problem with uh, data collaboratives is that it's not easy to scale up. Uh, there is quite often challenges in actually sustainability. 
There's also a lack of interoperability quite often, not only at the technical level, but also at the cultural level and governance and policy level, which means that there is fragmentation uh, within uh, data collaboratives as well. There's also a challenge with regard to quality and choice and to a large extent, uh, what's the social license uh, for data collaboration is quite often a big challenge in order to establish trust. And so what uh, we've tried to do, next slide, in the uh, paper is to experiment with uh, what the previous panel was calling for, actually documenting what is best practice and how can we then start using best practice to inform the creation of new data collaboratives and how can we turn the best practice into a canvas that basically documents these are the enabling conditions that one needs to consider so that it's not always um, reinventing uh, how one establishes data collaboratives but it's really about developing a practice and methodology for developing a data collaborative that has chances for success and for becoming more systematic, sustainable, and responsible. And so what we have focused on are far four areas where we believe a canvas needs to provide input on and where the those that are in charge of designing data collaboratives could also benefit from being probed on what the elements are towards those elements. Next slide. And they uh, range from government's uh, requirements, uh, such as, for instance, having a good understanding of what is actually the problem that one seeks to solve and what is the question, as opposed to immediately jump on the data and the data collection tool, but actually taking a step back and really thinking about the demand, which is what the next speaker will talk about. But also, of course, requirements at the operational level, at the technical and the human uh, uh, capacity level, and then also at the scientific uh, level in order to uh, extract insight that matters, not just insight that one can establish that then never is being used, but also really trying to understand who one seeks to inform and what are the uh, uh, ways to actually turn insight into action. Next slide. Now, of course, the canvas is now uh, and is included in the uh, report and can now be used for a variety of purposes. One is of course for rapid co-design of data collaboratives moving forward. And that's also what we've been looking into how that can play, but also for assessing different types of data collaboratives currently in place. And so what we've included in the report is a rapid assessment and comparison using the canvas across different ways of actually going about accessing Internet of Things data for air quality. So it can be used for gap assessment and it can be used for also evaluation and ranking on what are actually some of the tools and data spaces that might work better, especially at the city and local level, which was the focus, of course, of our uh, approach. Now, based upon our early gap assessment and application, next slide, we've already identified a few uh, areas for recommendation. One is, of course, uh, that it would actually help if there would be some kind of a common IoT governance framework. Of course, anyway, it all has to be fit for purpose, but at least if we would have a common understanding of these are the variables that determine good governance as it relates to IoT, it would help moving forward. But that requires also building capacity at the city level in order to design those data collaboratives. It's a skill set to really understand what is the problem and what's best for pur best uh, for purpose from a operational and partnership model. And that's also where we feel like the establishment of a new profession such as data stewards would benefit and would help actually making those decisions. And obviously key will be establishing the social license for using IoT data for air quality monitoring, which is why engaging citizens will be essential uh, moving forward. And obviously, uh, being a research experiment here, we actually do need a lot more uh, money, uh, a lot more uh, fine tuning of the canvas based upon further research, and also having a repository of best practices that can be translated into guidance. With that, over to you, Sven. Excellent. Many thanks, Stefan. Many, many thanks indeed for adding a completely new perspective to the discussion we had so far. 
So uh, you really were proposing and develop how to develop new methodologies to accelerate data-driven innovation for the public interest, especially when it comes to the governance of data in a more collaborative uh, way. Uh, one of the questions that came up uh, is actually how, how do you see actually new professions and new functions emerging within public organizations to actually be able to adopt and implement these kind of methodologies? Thanks, Sven. And as I already mentioned, and as you will see from the canvas, in order to establish a data collaboration or a partnership around data, there are X amounts of variables that comes into play and X amount of decisions that need to be taken. And at the moment, there is no uh, kind of profession or function quite often within the public sector that can really explore all those variables in a way that is best and fit for purpose. And so that's why we feel like the establishment of a data stewards function that understands what are the questions, what are the governance approaches to actually unlock some of the data and how do we do this in a sustainable and responsible way that also is technologically sound and innovative. That's where we feel like uh, a data steward or a chief data steward would, benefit, would, would be able to do that kind of fit for purpose assessment and is uh, what is currently missing, uh, which means that many of those data spaces or data collaboratives fall flat or never get established. Sven, you're muted. Yes. Okay. Ah, very good. So excellent. Thanks a lot, uh, Stefan, also for reminding me uh, and uh, resolving this issue. Um, brilliant. So I think the request is very clear. And with this, we move now to the demand side uh, of uh, data-driven innovation. So all talks until now really were looking into the supply and how to deliver data-driven innovation, but uh, actually focusing this on uh, uh, the needs uh, of society and of the private sector uh, has not been investigated much so far. So uh, for more insights, I hand over to Marina. Please go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sven, and good afternoon. Um, so I'm happy to report uh, Lina's contribution on the report, which uh, take a very particular angle on the issue of data-driven innovation from the sociology, but especially through the lens of data justice and critical data studies, which means that she touches upon um, some question of structural and power differential that happens when uh, data-driven innovation is unfolding in the practice, everyday practice of uh, the social actors involved uh, in putting in place. And she focused especially in on algorithmic uh, processes adopted uh, by public sector organization, uh, such as, no, okay, it was fine, the first uh, slide, sorry. Uh, can you go back uh, to you? Can you go back to the slides? Yes, okay. It's okay. So she focused on algorithmic uh, process adopted by public sector organizations, such as automated uh, decision tools to deliver public services, especially in welfare and social care. So as this slide shows, basically the overall objective of her chapter has been to provide uh, a concept and tools to examine the demand side of data-driven innovation, focusing on the actors that decide to adopt and later on really adopt uh, data innovation in public sector organization. And on this regard, the chapter has two main goals, to provide an overview of the different dimension um, of this demand, which means also to provide a more um, nuanced perspective about what needs uh, data-driven innovation respond to. And the second point was to review um, empirical research, methods for empirical research on the actual practices of data-driven innovation, looking at uh, actors involved in data-driven innovation from the employee to managers. So this, in this way, uh, the research allowed to zoom out 
from the technological dimension and instead to zoom in into the context in which innovation is implemented, especially uh, in public sector organization. So in the next slide, I show uh, some of the uh, dimensions that are examined in this chapter. And so different dimensions that explore the demand, the social demand for data-driven innovation from the drivers, which means that are the objectives that are uh, expected and for which data-driven innovation is implemented to the actual implementation. And in particular, uh, in this area, the chapter draw from uh, sociological studies that see how data innovation is implemented in public administration, highlighting some um, area of tension that might came up when these technologies are adopted, such as, uh, for instance, clashes between uh, managerial vision of data-driven innovation and the experiences of those uh, new technologies among frontline workers, such as counselor or case workers. So somehow the chapters in the, rev the review that is in the chapter um, shows that there could be a gap between a view from the top and what actually took place in the ground. And the third dimension is the question of the values, which, is, uh, which means that uh, when a data innovation is introduced in an organization, there might be different conflicting vision or assumption or disposition about how such um, new technology or new solution should, should work. Um, so moving to the next slide, basically uh, the chapter um, shows also some of the methods that can be used by researchers to, um, to learn more about the social demands. So they range from uh, digital methods and innovative research methods such as freedom of information requests uh, that basically per permit to ask public authorities about data systems that they have in place in, in their organization, to computational methods such as scraping government website, to more traditional methods such as document analysis surveys and qualitative interviews uh, with practitioners. One key message from the chapters is that a triangulation of methods should be encouraged to develop a scientifically sound and nuanced understanding of data innovation. And especially that also qualitative interviews can provide such information that is uh, very difficult to obtain with the other methods about these cultural clashes and uh, conflicting perspective that might be an obstacle to actually uh, successful implementation of data innovation. So in the next slide, uh, we can see that basically uh, this work, this chapter claims that we have now an increase in the uptake of automated decision tools for the delivery of public services, but that there is still somehow limited research on the social demands and the acceptance of such innovation by the different actors involved. And such kind of research can instead bring to the surface the tension and conflicts uh, around data innovation, especially among actors that work in public sector organization at different levels or in different uh, offices. So the chapters basically claims that to research the demand side of data-driven innovation in the public sector uh, is um, advisable to use a multi-method approach that combine that through that we can combine um, an understanding of the attitude and experiences among public sector workers and developers with the institutional and the organizational setting in which it uh, is implemented. I hope this was the overview of the chapter. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Marina, for, for stepping in. Uh, if I may, because I clearly hear your, your request here to research more on the demand side of data-driven innovation, uh, but maybe if you just could elaborate a little bit more uh, how you actually see how this empirical research on the social demand for data-driven innovation, how may this then actually inform policy making or foster uh, data use for the public good? Can you spend a few more words in, on it, yes. please, again, as the other three brief? Of course. I think basically this research goes in the same direction of the first presentation of this workshop, even if it's very different, because in a way, uh, an increased understanding of 
of this area, no, of this, this perspective and experiences and, and attitudes can really um, allow policymakers to know in advance what kind of, let's say, obstacle can arise in an organization when a data innovation is implemented. So basically, it is allowed to know better about um, how public servant may be reluctant or may feel that this a certain data innovation contradicts their role or how they are concerned about certain um, tools and so on. So it's really important to include in the discussion the specific actors. So in a way, this allows, I think, uh, it's, it's a strand of work that can improve uh, research and data-driven innovation in terms of making it more sustainable and fair in terms also of inclusion of, of more voices into the discussion, including the bottom-up uh, needs, basically. Very good. And indeed, very clear also that it helps the adoption of the solutions afterwards by those really implementing as a solution. Uh, yeah. Very well. So uh, with this, indeed, we move to the last speaker of today. Uh, and again, now we change perspective. We will actually uh, even now look at all the presentations that were given so far uh, and have a, a bird's eye view how all these kind of perspectives actually relate to European policy uh, and how to bridge the gaps between European policy making and what is happening locally at the municipal level. And for this talk, I hand over to Hillen. Please, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Thank you very much for the introduction and, of course, for the research by uh, all my colleagues and the collaboration with the JRC. Um, a very uh, broad range of topics and, uh, for me, um, very interesting to uh, have a look at it from the municipal perspective, as uh, Sven already introduced. Um, because with all these innovations taking place, it's, of course, very relevant to understand which steps, steps we can take towards local uptake uh, of these uh, research findings and what is needed in terms of uh, alignment between the trends, the policy as, and the local practices. Um, the, the research objectives, as Sven also already mentioned, was to have a, a bird's eye view on all of the research that was presented earlier and to explore uh, any strategic angles and key enablers for local uptake and to explore any issues in the local playing field uh, related to alignment of policies and practices that might influence uh, the ability for uptake on the local level. And the European data space has pro provided us with a very concrete frame of reference to, to make this validation, as well as uh, uh, having a look at the, the, uh, the uh, macroeconomic cloud-related trends in Europe uh, that, of course, are, are very relevant to these uh, topics. Next slide, please. Um, so we go to the, the first uh, objective. Um, uh, that basically sets the context um, and of course there's a lot that can be said about the local playing field um, within which all these developments take place but I'll uh, highlight just a few topics and the first is of course the absolute necessity for active involvement of cities, regions, uh, regions and municipalities not only because they can make a valuable contribution but because also there's uh, possible legislation to be anticipated and of course much to gain uh, by being able to participate in uh, future data collaborations. Um, however, there are of course issues that, uh, that, uh, that I have to be dealt with and a research by the European Investment Bank recently, especially focused on the regulatory uncertainty and the length of regulatory processes that make it very hard to focus efforts uh, with uh, capacity often already being scarce at the local level. Um, uh, apart from that, of course, also cross-border differences as interpretation of existing legislation and make it very hard to work towards something like a one-stop shop for digital services, but also for collaboration uh, uh, cross-border on, uh, on data exchange. And a lack of agility and interoperability has, of course, already been addressed in the previous topics as well. So with that in mind, let's go to the... Uh, the second objective um, that I mentioned uh, first, uh, see if there's uh, some strategic angles that we can look towards for, uh, for local uptake. And in the context that we've seen, um, that is characterized basically by an increasing speed of technological developments combined with regulatory uncertainty. Uncertainty, of course, the, the need for infrastructural agility is very important. 
and cloud portability is one of the approaches that can be taken uh, to work to balance basically ability uh, uh, sorry agility and stability uh, for for local um, authorities to be able to participate in these uh, developments and that only uh, requires um, not only uh, portability mechanisms that were uh, explained in one of the previous uh, presentations, but of course it's also very important to have supporting infrastructure and aligned and harmonized contractual agreements between providers, such as subscription levels, SLAs, uh, liability, etc. Because otherwise, even if you have it technically arranged, you still have other issues that the service level differs so greatly that you can never actually step out of any vendor lock-in patterns and move towards the different providers and have the ability to choose between those. And of course, the importance of collective procurement criteria is very great in this respect because it also contributes to harmonization, both technically and uh, in terms of uh, contractual agreements. If you could go to the next slide, please. Sorry about that. Um, the next is a topic that was also uh, addressed in one of the, uh, 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 could be seen in one of the cloud trends. And it's also, of course, related to edge computing uh, and binary data serialization. And that has to do with the efficiency uh, in data processing, also related to the energy aspects involved. And of course, um, the relevance is obvious considering the twin strategy uh, in Europe on both green and digital, which basically makes this a combined effort. And most of the references to this topic in this body of research that we've looked at today is, of course, uh, technical in nature. Um, and it's good to be aware that, of course, not many municipalities active, actively develop their digital solutions themselves. So here it's important that this kind of alignment and this working towards efficiency and data processing and, and therefore in energy also um, is, is uh, related uh, to creating basically a digital agenda that supports uh, environmental themes, but also um, linked to the research that we've just discussed previously, uh, looks at which um, um, topics actually benefit from these uh, digital data uh, collaborations and exchanges, uh, rather than having a more social uh, requirement for the, for the most uh, beneficial effects. Um, so, of, of course, also an option to make sure that you embed considerations for energy efficiency in your uh, local policies and in your procure procurement criteria so that uh, by combining these uh, in uh, collective procurement schemes uh, you can achieve high volume in impact as well and especially in the discussion on data centers which of course are uh, a very relevant part of the uh, infrastructure to support this whole uh, development this is a very relevant topic to uh, to look into also from the local perspective if you could go to the next slide please um, that's the uh, third strategic angle distilled from these uh, findings, and that has to do with the importance of balancing demand and supply. And it's, of course, important to determine which uh, data-driven innovations create added social value, uh, once again, also seen in the previous study. But it also helps to focus the efforts, especially with local resources being scared. And it's, of course, very important to focus on the desired societal impact that you're looking forward uh, to achieve in your region. Um, taking into account that um, capacity is scarce and technical expertise is also scarce, I think it's very important to at least locally organize, uh, organize minimum capacity to participate in, in any kind of collaboration. So you don't have to have the whole skill set on board, but at least make sure that you're able to set the agenda properly, that you have political support, um, that you're able to manage the projects and the contracts that, uh, that come uh, uh, into, into view and that you can uh, work towards uh, community building. So you don't have to have all the capacity uh, within your organization, but it's of course this community that you can uh, make use of and collaborate with intensively. Um, and this is also a very important aspect towards uh, business to government data collaborations, uh, being prepared and being able to set your goals clearly as a local uh, uh, authority is, is vital because uh, a lot of uh, policy relevant data is, of course, held by privatized sectors such as energy and health and mobility. So to be able to collaborate and access uh, these, uh, this data in these uh, sectors 
you have to make sure that you're also prepared yourself to, to contribute to these kind of collaborations. And therefore, it's important that you also consider working towards preparing local data sets that, that can be, uh, that can be uh, integrated and, uh, and exchanged as needed. Uh, and this takes a conscious effort uh, as well. If you could go to the next slide. Um, what we've also seen uh, and mentioned uh, a lot previously was the issue of interoperability. And uh, what the research indicated is that the sooner you take this into consideration, especially taking new uh, and working towards new data sets, the, the less effort it actually takes to implement. So, um, of course, for this, it's very important to uh, have the availability of clear specifications. And the higher up these have been established, the better, because it's easier to, uh, to work towards a greater uh, alignment between those. So this also takes an effort where you need local contribution, but also uh, uh, multiple levels of, of um, collaboration to make sure that you uh, work towards this uh, clear set of specifications. And for existing data sets, uh, it's of course uh, important to have data quality strategies as well, make sure that you, uh, in, in order to be able to participate in these developments, uh, also considering the, the legislation that of course is, uh, might come towards uh, the local authorities as well, uh, in, in, as mentioned in the inception impact assessment for the data spaces, uh, there's, there's simply uh, work to be done. And it's of course very helpful to prioritize on what helps uh, uh, free up capacity for personal service delivery, to citizens and what actually helps societal challenges uh, relevant to your uh, local area. And if we could go to the last topic, um, this uh, focus on the importance of organizing a continuous exploratory dialogue to align the trends, the policy developments and the local practices. And this is particularly important considering the dynamic context, of course, in which the lengthy regulatory processes take place in combination with the diversity in practices at the local level. We've seen it, uh, there's no such thing as interoperability uh, at the IoT level, of course, uh, there are a lot of differences in practices and uh, cultures and, and uh, uh, situations uh, at the local level with uh, the amount of municipalities and cities that we have in the European Union. Um, of course, it's very important that uh, local authorities and um, uh, and their communities actively uh, are involved um, in, in these practices uh, because it's important to be able to, to uh, provide relevant uh, input based on actual experience. And it's uh, very helpful to build thematic or regional alliances to participate in such collaborations uh, and include these, uh, uh, these, uh, these canvases that uh, Stefan has introduced, of course, helps to speed up this process because it helps uh, focus on what is needed to work towards such collaborations. And important in these dialogues to also uh, be open to the issues that stand in the way so that you can see how, uh, how further either research or, or uh, test uh, projects can be uh, um, uh, taken into action to, uh, to work towards more collaboration. And um, go to the last slide. Um, basically, uh, it's very clear from all the research that we've seen that it's only through many small steps that we can work towards the establishment of the data spaces and uh, to pave the way, uh, continuous exploratory dialogue to bridge the gap between trends, uh, the policies and the local practices is essential to make uh, the entire uh, uh, whole of Europe with its cities, uh, regions and municipalities fit for the digital age. And I think we've taken a very interesting and uh, relevant step today in this session. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Helen. Very good, very good. Uh, you really got a, a deep dive also uh, and ho hopefully a lot of appetite to also look at this section of the report. I think it's really, uh, exciting and impressive to see this connection between the European level of policies and municipalities. Um, what I'm actually wondering um, is, uh, can you say a few more words how to best strike the balance between the use of common methods and common tools and common mechanisms uh, as compared to tailoring solutions to the particular need of each single municipality? Uh, is this an issue at all, uh, or do you have any thoughts uh, about this potential uh, dilemma there? Um, 
I uh, yeah, it, it's it's definitely a challenge. I think a, a lot of discussion has been going about uh, going on about open standards, as we've seen the importance of that, and any any uh, move towards uh, open standards and open technology also automatically includes the ability to to uh, to change your mind and to move towards um, new forms of of uh, technologies that you can use. So I think in this case, any anything that works towards um, uh, agility is perhaps even more important than uh, to be able to force into a decision for either one of the approaches that you've just mentioned. Um, so I think that's most uh, most important. Um, it's also very important, I think, at the local level to to be aware of of what is available and uh, some kind of trend watching or, or or some kind of platform where these um, uh, these developments are shared is very important. We of course have living in EU as a platform where such uh, developments are shared. That's a very uh, good starting point to to explore what is available and what is possible. And based on your agenda, it's always good to to uh, to focus on that which helps you and your local community the most in relation to the bigger trends. Um, and uh, I think everybody always prefers to have the, the best of the best 100% tailor-made, but it's very important to also, when, you, when it comes to sharing and exchanging, to, to, uh, to be able to maybe um, uh, give up some of your 100% uh, perfect uh, challenges, or sorry, d demands, and, and, uh, and see how you can let some of those go and more, move towards more common methods. Very good. Yeah, I like this answer. I think also Francesca, uh, Federica may say something about it. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, but before we go there, uh, indeed, I would also like to come back quickly to Stefan and Marina, maybe with a bit related question. Um, so basically, um, the both works that were presented just before on uh, urban data quality, but also on the demand uh, side were, of course, the results of first exper experiments. So my question to, to both of you would be, where do you see really possibilities or also obstacles uh, to replicate the work you did in the experiment or that uh, Lina did on dedicated experiments uh, for another topic or in another uh, context? Could you just share a few insights about uh, this question with us before we then uh, move to the takeaways uh, in a second? So Marina, Stefan, who wants to go first? Okay, I can go first. First of all, I didn't mention that Lina's work uh, concluded a little bit earlier than expected because she's in maternity leave at the moment. So indeed, we were expecting to have a prototype for uh, a survey uh, mm -hmm. and in general for a method to be used uh, to conduct uh, you know, EU-wide research on the demands of social innovation, so uh, on, uh, on uh, data innovation. So to be... So in this peculiar case, we didn't develop a really a prototype. We were in the process of doing so. So, um, so to be honest, I don't see uh, a problem in doing it, even if uh, uh, her work was mainly uh, designed for asking questions about public sector organization. So I guess uh, a different kind of literature or input could be used for developing uh, tools for other institutions. But yes, I don't see, I mean, it's very flexible because it's really uh, thinking about methods to collect data in different uh, settings, so yeah. Excellent, very good. Uh, Stefan, what can you add to this instead of repeating yeah. anything? <laughs> Go ahead. No, well, I think, the, uh, <laughs> I think uh, well, replication is always the big uh, question, which is why, um, anyway, the canvas should be more seen as a methodology that can be applied in a variety of settings without a clear um, uh, prescription on what always needs to happen. It's more a way to actually nudge the designers of data collaboratives in taking into account a set of best practices and then apply that to their particular kind of context and particular kind of needs. So in principle, it should be, uh, it's meant to be replicated but obviously it was designed for cities and it was designed for uh, IoT data, but I don't see any challenges with some tweaks to actually replicate it and reuse it for other purposes. Very good. So we really hear uh, a, a we can giving some guidance and that's excellent. 
Uh, I didn't change anything in my setup, I'm sorry. Um, but it's my really last words. And so can we go to the next slide? Because uh, indeed we still want to hear from uh, Federica and Euro cities, um, because I think also the, just the direction this discussion went, uh, it borrows itself, it lends itself to, to ask actually Euro cities and a network of cities, um, what are your main takeaways uh, from, uh, from the last three talks? If you wish, because you're last speaker, you can also uh, share some lessons uh, overall. Feel free uh, sharing your core takeaways from, uh, from the session and uh, the event today. Federica, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, no, I would like also to thank uh, the speakers of this panel, but uh, the, the, all the panels, because uh, they were great, really great examples, inspiring ones, and also key insights also on all the, the research uh, work that has been uh, done. Uh, also for me and for, and for our work uh, uh, in Eurocities as the network of major European cities uh, uh, in Europe. So um, all the, the aspects that have been mentioned uh, in this panel and all the, uh, let's say, challenges, you know, for uh, data-driven innovation and uh, uh, brought me also to rethink and reminded me of uh, all the work that we have done as Eurocities uh, uh, in the context of the Living.eu initiative that was mentioned also uh, by uh, in this panel. Um, on business to government data sharing. It was a, a series, we developed a series of workshops on uh, how to really better uh, share uh, data from the businesses to, to the government. And uh, we really looked into specific, uh, uh, let's say, use cases from uh, mobility to uh, energy. Um, and uh, um, there were really a number of challenges that have been uh, raised uh, in, in that context that were raised here. I'm thinking about the, the governance on, on, on the data sharing, on the technical interoperability aspects, or cultural shift, uh, uh, but also uh, how to develop you know, common data sets, uh, legislative and skills. You know, I mean, all aspects that have been mentioned also here. And uh, um, one of the, uh, let's say, uh, key uh, issue that was uh, uh, really brought up was this uh, need of uh, uh, collaborative and cooperation uh, models uh, uh, for uh, really push more and enhance uh, 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 more uh, data to be shared and to be used uh, and to be uh, then also reused and then and, and develop, uh, uh, as, as we can say, but then more solutions and more in, in innovation. And uh, of course, the, the data spaces are one of the mechanisms, one of the tools and where uh, this can be can be developed. And uh, as part of our um, position paper on better uh, business to government data sharing that we have released, that uh, we also uh, try to really push um, and to make city authorities to really be recognized and empowered to become data intermediaries. Uh, so to really ensure that the citizen can access and can manage their data in, in local ecosystems. Um, so we would like to, to have uh, the, the, uh, the city, the local governments to uh, to be involved in all this, uh, uh, this discussion be and, and to play, uh, because they can really play a key, a key role uh, in, in really better uh, en enhancing a better and more uh, data, data sharing. So for me, is, uh, it was really uh, enlightening, you know, this, this discussion, because uh, I could really see uh, that also our messages uh, been have been taken in in a way and uh, and uh, and I hope that all the work that will be uh, done in the future also in the context of uh, uh, of the data spaces and thanks also to all the work within the living the EU initiative uh, can really uh, help cities in that way that's all from my side excellent thanks a lot Federica I think that was really enlightening for us to hear that it was also useful and you really enjoyed the session. I hope the uh, in between we had uh, 130 people dialing in. So I hope everybody really enjoyed this session uh, and the entire afternoon. Uh, thanks again uh, to you, Federica, but of course also to uh, Stefan, Marina uh, and Hillen. And with this, uh, I hand over for, for uh, a quick closing because we're already slightly late. 
um, but please back to uh, uh, the, the one expert which actually helped us to uh, coordinate all the others and he's also the first author of the report, Carlos, uh, back to you. Thank you very much, Sven. Thank you as well to all the speakers and participants in this in this webinar. And basically, one minute recap, right? Uh, because we are behind the schedule. Uh, the first thing is that obviously the report is online, so you can you can access and read all the chapters. Here you go, and and you need actually all the presentations held today. Actually, you can find in the report with more details, so you can pick one one experiment which means one chapter and read all the details and access to the associated data and code when applicable and basically uh, just to summarize as well the, the in a couple of work is that these experiments actually explore different conditions and configuration of emerging technologies and trends right whose results may contribute to this pragmatic thinking ambition that that we mentioned today for data sharing, reuse, exchanging, and integration, right? And well, technology is important, but it's not only uh, technology, but also actual new, new organizational and collaborative ways in order to find this um, balanced way between technology, between demand and, and supply, right? So both together is actually what saved this report in order to, to find these collaborative solutions between this governance of data and governance with data. And in the end, it's basically just to make these tools and technology more accessible to regional and local actors, which is actually one of the uh, interesting, uh, interesting messages that we, we transmitted today. And that's it. Basically, I hand over to Simon in order for closing. And thank you very much for your for your attention today. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos, for this uh, short and compact uh, wrap up. So all things are coming to an, to an end. So is this webinar. So before we close down, I will just uh, share with you some further information. So um, in the following days, uh, you will receive all the links about the, this uh, webinar, about the presentation, slides, recording, and of course, the link to the report. So for all the registered people and for also that monitored uh, the, the webinar through our uh, um, YouTube channel. Uh, so you have here also some links when you can follow us uh, on join up on Elisa channel and on Twitter. And uh, last but not least, I would like to thank you all the participants uh, in the virtual room today and also on the uh, at the live streaming on the on, on the on the YouTube channel. Uh, of course, uh, all the thanks to the uh, presenters and the speakers for all the sessions presenting all the chapters of the report. Uh, thanks also to all the uh, policy and science discutant, discutants in all the in all the sections, and of course to all the moderators. And you are kindly invited, of course, to follow us at our next uh, webinars. So thank you once again, and have a nice day. <laughs>